Now we are not quite finished our reading in the book of Job, and I want to ask you to turn with me now to the 16th chapter of the book of Job, Job chapter 16, and we shall read from the beginning. Then Job replied, I have heard many things like these. Miserable comforters are you all. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I also could speak like you if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you. But my mouth would encourage you. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. Yet if I speak, my pain is not relieved. And if I refrain, it does not go away. Surely, O God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. You have bound me, and it has become a witness. My gauntness rises up and testifies against me. God assails me and tears me in his anger and gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me his piercing eyes. Men open their mouths to jeer at me. They strike my cheek in scorn and unite together against me. God has turned me over to evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. All was well with me, but he shattered me. He seized me by the neck and crushed me. He has made me his target. His archers surround me. Without pity, he pierces my kidneys and spills my gall on the ground. Again and again he bursts upon me. He rushes at me like a warrior. I have sewed sackcloth over my skin and buried my brow in the dust. My face is red with weeping. Deep shadows ring my eyes. Yet my hands have been free of violence and my prayer is pure. O earth, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. Even now, my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high, my intercessor is my friend, as my eyes pour out tears to God. On behalf of a man, he pleads with God, as a man pleads for his friend. Only a few years will pass before I go on the journey. Of no return. These words in the 16th chapter of the book of Job are, at least in my own view, among the most spine chilling to be found anywhere in the whole of Scripture. They are an expression of the deepest conceivable personal anguish. But you and I know what lay behind them. And of course, part of the explanation for their excruciating character is that what we know, this servant of God called Job did not know. He was, as we read earlier on, a man marked by faithfulness and integrity a man whom God had richly blessed, both in his family life and in his life as a businessman. And then, one day, we are told in these opening chapters, Satan came with the angels of God and appeared in the throne room of God and threw down the gauntlet to God, essentially in these terms. God, he said, you point Job out to me as a classic example of a man of faith. But God, I want to tell you this. 
there is no one on the face of the earth who really seeks your glory. No one on the face of the earth who really trusts you, whatever the circumstances. There is none on the earth who will stand by you. And because I know I cannot destroy you and take you from your throne, I throw down this challenge. Find someone on the face of the earth who likewise seeks to exalt you on your throne on high. And God says to him, Have you not given serious consideration to my servant Job, a man full of faith and reverence and godly trust in me? Here is a man who will stand by me whatever befalls him. And so the challenge is taken up. And Satan is given space in order to wreak havoc upon Job's life. His possessions are taken from him. His cattle and his fields and his land, his houses and his home, his servants are destroyed. And then, in this last, it would seem cruel blow, his family is wiped out at one single stroke by some horrid act of demonic power. And yet Job still stands trusting in the Lord. The Lord has given, he says, and with broken heart he bows before him, confessing that it is the Lord who also takes away. Therefore his Savior Lord is to be blessed. And then Satan comes again before the presence of God and challenges God even further. I've seen him continue to trust in you, but you never let me touch him personally. Go and touch him then personally, but spare his life, says God, and you will again see a man who trusts in me absolutely. And so Job's body is racked with sores, his being broken by pain, His wife, seeing him in his need, says, Job, will you not simply speak a curse against God and die that you may be relieved of your misery? And yet Job remains faithful to the Lord until his friends gather. And his friends, in an extraordinary gesture of sympathy, sit beside him in his need for seven long days and nights in absolute silence until there begins the round of conversations and discussions and debates which constitutes most of the book of Job until God steps in again at the end and speaks his final word. And the essence of those discussions amounts to this. Job says to his friends, I cannot fully understand why God is allowing this to happen in my life. But I know I have remained faithful to him. Yes, I may have failed, but in my heart I have remained faithful to him. I trust him and I know he is the Lord who is my Savior. And his friends, by contrast, constantly come to him in different accents and with different nuances of meaning and say to him, Job, one thing is certain in this world. The faithful prosper. The wicked suffer. You are suffering. Therefore, you must have sinned. And what we have here in this great confession of Job in chapter 16 is almost in a nutshell the development of his experience from a point of virtual despair to a point in which he virtually sees the answer to his need and is on the brink of triumph and glory and victory. And you will notice that that development takes place in a very simple way, in three stages. It begins in verses 1 to 5 with an expression 
of Job's alienation from his friends. It develops in verse 6 to verse 17 by an expression of Job's antagonism against God. And it ends in verses 18 through 21 with a confession of the answer to Job's need. It begins, as I say, in these opening verses with Job's sense of alienation from his friends. The New Testament, of course, speaks about the patience of Job in James chapter 5. But by patience, we ought not to think of Job being tranquil and peaceful so much as Job being gutsy and determined. That's what James means. Job was gutsy and determined as a man of faith in the face of great trial and difficulty. But at this point in the book of Job, he has become so exasperated with the incessant counsel of his friends that as we would say, he has had it up to here with their words of counsel. You, he says, in effect, are a bunch of windbags Windy words, he says, is all that proceeds from you. It is all hot air. You keep telling me that I am suffering because I have sinned in some particular way, and I keep telling you that whatever the explanation for my suffering, it is not because I have abandoned my trust in God. Your counsel, he says, is a counsel of absolute despair to me. And of course, he is beginning to feel after the principle that those of us who have read, as we have done a little from the beginning of the book of Job, understand. This man is not suffering because he has sinned in some specific way against God. This man is suffering because throughout the whole of his life, he has lived a life of glorious faithfulness to God. And what Job is feeling after, and it sometimes in this book almost seems to take hold of, is the great biblical principle that runs from the beginning of the Bible to its end. That the man or woman of faith, the man or woman whose life is utterly cast upon the Lord, whatever their circumstances may be, is bound to be the person who will draw enemy fire and whom Satan will seek to destroy. And Job in particular is feeling after this principle. If Satan cannot ultimately destroy the man or woman of faith, then Satan will seek to destroy that believer's enjoyment of faith. That believer's enjoyment of grace. If Satan cannot sweep from his throne the Almighty God, then Satan will do everything in his powers to destroy our joyful communion with that Almighty God and our daily trust in Him. We wrestle not, says the Apostle Paul, against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers, the dark enemies in this world, he says. And the great illustration of that in the Old Testament is found here in this man, Job, who suffers under an explosion of persecution at the hand of the evil one. And it's hardly surprising that these friends who in many ways have such a great grasp of some of the truths of Scripture, it's hardly surprising that he becomes alienated from them because he is living in a world of experience about which they know virtually nothing. And in this respect, he says, You are a bunch of windbags and of no use to me. But that alienation from his friends acts as a kind of catalyst in Job's experience to produce something far more sinister and 
almost infinitely more dangerous. And this, of course, is Satan's purpose, that in the midst of his alienation from his friends, Job should begin to develop in his heart an antagonism against God. And you see the way in which this comes out in the central part of the chapter in verses 6 through 17. This cry from the heart that is almost too anguished for us to read. It's marked in the first place by a confusion of identity. Listen to what he says to God. Verse 7, God, you have worn me out. You have devastated my entire household. Verse 9, God assails me and tears me in his anger, gnashes his teeth at me. My opponent fastens on me his piercing eyes. Verse 11, God has turned me over to evil men and thrown me into the clutches of the wicked. Job is suffering, I say, from a confusion of identity. Because as we know, the one who has done all these things to him is not God, his heavenly Father, but Satan, his adversary. And yet you see how subtle Satan's work in this man's life has come to be. He has so worked in this man's life that he is beginning to confuse the identity of God with the identity of Satan. Satan, as you remember the book of Revelation tells us, disguises himself in the form of a lamb but speaks with the terrible voice of the dragon. And that's what's happening here in Job's life. He is beginning to attribute to God the things that Satan has done in his life. And has become guilty of a confusion of identity. Because what Satan is seeking to do to him, and this is a perpetual principle, what Satan is seeking to do to him is to get him to think about God in the worst possible light. That's why there is not only a confusion of identity present here, there is a confusion of character. The very thing that Satan sought to do in the Garden of Eden when Satan came and said, as God set you in this beautiful garden, and is he the kind of God who sets you in beautiful places and then will not give you your heart's desire? What kind of God is that? And you sense how easily Job has begun to succumb to the wiles of the devil. He's beginning to say, yes, that's the kind of God he is. He discards me. He attacks me. He is my enemy. He opposes me. He destroys me. He crushes me. Oh God, he says, why are you doing this to me? And the truth of the matter is that it isn't God at all. And Satan has not only brought into his mind a confusion of identity, but a confusion of character. You see that in these verses. For example, in verses 6 to 8. Job thinks about God as his persistent accuser. And then in verses 9 to 11, he thinks about God as some roaring, devouring beast. God assails me and tears me in his anger, gnashes his teeth at me. And in verses 12 to 14, he sees God as the destroyer of his faith and his hope and his love, and his pleasure in his heavenly Father. And the remarkable thing, of course, is that when we turn to the New Testament, the New Testament actually gives names to Satan to describe these very activities. He is, says the book of Revelation, the accuser of the brethren. He is The one, says Simon Peter, who goes about like a roaring, devouring beast, a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He is, says the book of Revelation again, to be known 
as Apollyon, or in the Hebrew says Revelation, Abaddon. And it's an amazing thing that that word Abaddon is used in the book of Job more frequently than in the rest of the Bible put together. Because here is the man who came, as it were, all unknown, face to face with Satan as the one who would seek to destroy his faith. And yet there are moments in the book of Job when you sense that the man has almost reached his hand into heaven and found the answer to his need. For example, in chapter 9, in the midst of similar cries of pain and anguish, he cries out, accusing God of doing similar things. He cries out in his need, O God, he says, if it is not you, who then is it? And if this were a stage play you were watching sitting in the theater, wouldn't you want to shout out, Oh, Job, Job, it's not God at all. It's not God, Job. It's Satan. It's Satan. But what we know, Job scarcely begins to grasp. And so in this hour of immense darkness, the tragedy that begins to enshroud him like a dark and sinister cloud is that he is beginning to think about God in terms that should be reserved by the Christian believer exclusively for Satan. And that's exactly what Satan is seeking to do. But will you notice, not only is there Job's sense of alienation from his friends and this new spirit of antagonism against God, but there is at the close of the chapter, however dimly, a most marvelous expression of Job's sense of the answer to his need. Because you see, he needs two things essentially. He needs a champion who will fight for him and overcome his enemy. And he needs a friend, a mediator, who will intercede for him at the right hand of God. And do you notice that he says in these verses that this is exactly what he seeks and believes that he has? O earth, he says, verse 18, do not cover my blood. May my cry never be laid to rest. It's a cry for someone to come and be his champion and overcome his enemy. And in verse 19, my witness is in heaven, my advocate is on high, my intercessor is my friend. As my eyes pour out tears to God on behalf of a man, he pleads with God. You see what he's feeling after? What an amazing mystery, indeed miracle it is, that Job had the faith to penetrate through the clouds of darkness, the satanic insinuations that had almost destroyed his faith, And by faith he reaches up into heaven, believing that there is someone there at the right hand of God who will be his champion and who will intercede for him with his heavenly Father. Of course, he could not have known what we now know. He could not have said, as the Apostle Paul encourages us to say, Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who can accuse us when it is Christ who died, indeed has been raised from the dead, and is now at the right hand of God, making intercession for us? The very champion Job needed, you and I may have by faith in Christ. Him who is the seed of this woman who bruised the head of the serpent. Him who turned the cross of Calvary 
into a triumphal chariot in which he rode over the faces of his enemy. He who has destroyed Satan's power and overcome the princes of darkness and opened the kingdom of heaven and shined upon us the smiling face of God our Heavenly Father and said to us, Here is the proof He really loves you. He has sent me to die for you. And we who know that even now at the Father's right hand He stands as our friend and our mediator saying to His Father as He sees us under the assaults of Satan, My Father, you see them in their need. You see them in their suffering. In the midst of their darkness, shine the light of your grace into their lives that there may come in the midst of temptations to malign you that cry from the heart that says, If it is not you, my Father, who then is it? has the understanding to say it is my enemy, the evil one and by God's grace I see him for what he is in all his sinister deception I name him and call him out of the darkness for what he has done it is you my enemy and not you my heavenly father who have done this. My friends, I say to you out of another deepening conviction that this is one of the most important things for us to grasp in the whole of our Christian life, the thing Satan chiefly wants to do in your Christian life is to fill you with thoughts of your Heavenly Father that are more appropriate to Satan than they are to the Lord. And he is widely successful in accomplishing his purposes. And we need to learn from the darkness of Job's experience that this is the hand of Satan and not the hand of the Father. And how do we learn that? We learn that when we hear God say to us in his word, If I did not spare my own son for you, but gave him up on the cross, will I withhold anything from you that is for your good and your blessing and your salvation? Would I do that to you when I love you? without promising that whatever Satan seeks to do in your life, I will be there for you and with you. And my son's death and resurrection is the guarantee. He wants, my friends, to destroy your enjoyment of fellowship with God. And in some of us, he's accomplished it. Isn't that true? In some of us, he's accomplished it. And we need to recognize his presence and overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Let's begin to do that partly in song by singing some verses from our closing hymn number 406. Hymn number 406, we'll sing verses 1 and 2. A safe stronghold our God is still, a trusty shield and weapon.